Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the next session of the Global Forum. I am um, uh, delighted to present a session that um, we kind of designed with patient participation. We are going to talk about lifelong care and how NGOs can help in that process in encouraging lifelong care for a um, patient with uh, pediatric and congenital heart disease. And um, we will have, um, I'll speak a little bit about it at first. Then we have uh, Ms. Amy Verstappen, who is uh, president of the Global Alliance for Rheumatic and Congenital Hearts, an alliance of patient and family organizations uh, from around the world. Uh, we have Miss uh, Grace Gerald from, um, from um, Malaysia, and she will speak about her experience as a patient um, uh, advocate. And then we have a um, couple of presentations from uh, one from South America and one from New Zealand. Um, I don't think we will need um, the full time that has been allotted to us so generously, but um, I do believe that uh, we will have a good uh, session where we could have a nice discussion at the end. So um, let me just share my screen so I can start us off. And if uh, everyone can mute their uh, microphones, please, I would appreciate that. All right. So I would love to um, share a little bit about what NGOs could be doing in terms of lifelong care. It is a principle of providing care for pediatric and congenital heart patients that we believe in. Um, but we often see that that may be not something that a lot of NGOs are doing. Um, first of all, I'm sure that you already have seen some of this data already, but I wanted to bring it up again um, for all of us that um, congenital heart disease is a major contributor to infant mortality. Uh, this is the data from the Global Burden of Disease Study. Um, as you can see in high income countries, it's the second cause of infant mortality. Um, in low income countries, it's seventh fourth and second, uh, respectively, in lower middle income and upper middle income countries, which are really the countries that are the most affected by, um, by this mortality because they, the kids are surviving from um, other more preventable causes of mortality. And today, the global burden of disease, of heart disease, congenital heart disease specifically, um, is we know that it's mostly situated in the poorest parts of the world, uh, which is sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and uh, if we focus on the last two numbers that I'm showing here on the slide, is that 96% of the deaths are in low and middle income countries, and 70% of those are in infancy. So this shows us where we need to start. We need to be um, building more capacity so kids in infancy are surviving congenital heart disease specifically. Um, at the same time, if we look at what we're trying to achieve, um, that it's, which is improve pediatric cardiac health, um, that comes through equitable access to pediatric cardiac care, we have actually several determinants of access. Uh, one is availability of care. The next one is quality of care. Care needs to be affordable because most families cannot afford to pay out of pocket. There needs to be a general awareness in the society and the community about um, the disease and the burden. And it needs to be physically accessible. You know, can't expect people to be traveling too far for frequent appointments. And at the same time, we know that congenital heart disease specifically is not preventable and it's lifelong. It is complex and the costs are catastrophic to the family. And so again, this gives the um, impetus of where NGOs, nonprofit organizations can be investing specifically for lifelong care and for um, uh, accessibility of, of the care. Um, this is just something that we did with one of the cardiologists that I work with at Children's HeartLink. We're trying to understand, trying to get a sense of all congenital or most congenital heart defects. Um, um, as a percentage of the total, how many actually would need some intervention over the course of their lifetime? And as you can see, we came up with about 70% will need some sort of intervention over the course of their lifetime. Um, this means a surgery, a catheterization, 
um, um, or a medical a medical treatment. But again, this is this is a condition that um, requires um, access to care and requires care across the life course of people um, who are born with it. And um, some of the some of the data that has come out recently, um, this is data from, um, from England, I believe, um, they showed that um, beyond what we think that if we're saving the lives through surgical interventions or catheterization interventions, if we're saving those lives in the um, in infancy, um, we actually, uh, both of, all of those patients actually have um, higher risks of mortality um, in throughout their lifetime, um, especially the more complex patients. Um, this is some data from, or some kind of recommendations that the American College of Cardiology has come up with um, in terms of that we are seeing a lot better survival today. This is from the United States, um, that survival into adulthood. However, we do see long-term congenital heart disease challenges um, in terms of um, valve problems, pulmonary hypertension, um, abnormal arrhythmias, um, um, psychological and psychosocial problems, um, and the rest, as you can see here. So these are patients that are at higher risk and at need of, as we call, lifelong care. Um, at the same time, um, pediatric and adult congenital cardiology, um, it's not greatly developed across the world. Just a couple of examples in the US of what we're expecting, that we expect board certification. Uh, it's a sub subspecialty. Um, we still do not have a sufficient number of cardiologists, um, but these are some of the recommendations that the community is making, the congenital pediatric cardiology uh, community is making. And um, they really need to work hand in hand with primary care providers who have to be informed. Um, primary care, both um, in urgent care, actually providers who have to be informed um, and aware about um, the condition to be referring patients to the right um, appropriate adult congenital specialty. Um, in the um, uh, in England, this is the National Health System in England, uh, they actually have published a follow-up, post-surgical follow-up. However, as you can see, I just want to point out, this is a great um, and very comprehensive follow-up, but it does end at patients transitioning to adult services and um, at, at discharge. So it's really not sufficient. We are still not thinking, even in some of the best developed uh, places in the world, we're still not thinking about follow-up. Um, again, the expectations for pediatric and congenital cardiology in England um, are a little bit more prescriptive because they do have a, a very comprehensive system set up there, um, but there's no um, um, complete framework for how that should happen. And um, again, going back to CardioSmart from, um, at the, from the ACC, um, they have started making actually recommendations to patients on what they should be doing, seeking emotional support, um, making sure that they have pregnancy care um, uh, in our healthcare system in the United States, looking at insurance options, maintaining um, dental checkups, exercise, um, there's a lot of advocacy that is happening in our community today. And I believe uh, Ms. Verstappen will talk about that um, after me. Again, just want to point out um, the most complex patients. This is a roadmap that was um, that was published in a um, paper uh, about uh, four or five years ago. And again, this roadmap ends at transition to adult services uh, without much detail. So again, we do not have good systems. Um, last, the American Academy of Pediatrics. Again, this is Academy of Pediatrics. They're concerned mostly with children until um, everyone until age of 18, but also their um, recommendations and adolescents. Um, so we are thinking about it, but as our patients are surviving, we are not um, sufficiently discussing this. So um, I will speak from the perspective of Children's HeartLink, um, the organization I work for, um, and give a few examples of where we're trying to do follow-up. I will say it right away that we are not um, sufficiently advocating for lifelong care and for lifelong follow-up for um, the patients that our partner sites work with. 
but um, I'll just give some examples of what we do. So who is Children's Heartlink? Um, it's um, an NGO nonprofit organization based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, we have three streams of work. One is um, thought leadership and health policy and advocacy. Um, another one is developing patient care and referral pathways. And most of our work is really building capacity um, and building centers of excellence um, at hospitals where surgical and catheterization services are being provided. This is where um, the bulk of the majority of the children's heartlinks activities um, happen with uh, partnering hospitals in six countries around the world, as you can see on the map here. Um, so a few examples of what we've done. Uh, we published um, the patient education discharge instructions. And you can see here a nurse is actually talking to families right before their children their uh, children are going to be discharged from a hospital following a heart surgery um, and um, uh, explaining to them what um, they should be doing after they go home. Um, the PD, as we call them, empower parents and caregivers to improve care for children who have undergone heart operations by providing them with discharge instructions as I said, and a unique uh, aspect of that is that it empowered, it was geared specifically for nurses and empowered nurses to provide discharge training to parents. Um, where in situations where that uh, training in the past or those that discharge was done by a doctor. Now this training is being provided by nurses in the institutions, the hospitals where PD was um, implemented. We have a whole package and there's a low literacy tool, the one that you saw the nurse um, reading from, which is pretty much the same pictures that you see here on the right hand of the screen. Um, there's a higher literacy tool with um, a bit more text, um, but um, in my experience that has become kind of obsolete that the pictures uh, has been very, the tool with the pictures has been very popular. Um, there's also a nurse training e-module um, and posters that you can see here in the picture, um, the posters that uh, hang in the in the wards and in the intensive care unit. Um, they're open source and we've translated them in several languages. Um, and they really teach on um, several specific aspects of nutrition, um, how to uh, clean the wound, um, what kind of physical activity patients can have, and uh, how to manage their medication. Um, as you can see here, what is the appropriate way to hold the baby after the baby has had heart surgery? You don't lift them from underneath the, mm -hmm. their arms. Um, um, just things like that. They're very simple and um, very explanatory. Um, and the goal when we were developing them was to reduce um, post-discharge wound infection because that was a problem that was identified by several of our partner sites. For full disclosure, I just want to say that we are right now um, reviewing the uh, PD package um, and we'll be releasing a new version of, of this, but the, the content will be more or less the same. Um, so some of the results of a study that was done um, on PD um, that most of our partner sites actually have implemented the PD tools. Uh, before PD was implemented, we started this in a um, couple of institutions um, and uh, we saw that some sites had um, 20 surgical site infections um, out of 390 procedures um, that was associated with over $4,000 uh, mean readmission costs. Um, and after PD implementation, the um, surgical site infections actually reduced, even though the um, readmissions um, or the revisits um, actually increased, but uh, we had fewer uh, surgical site infections, as you can see, and a lower readmission costs. So um, Dr. Sandra Stavesky from um, UCSF really studied this and um, that was her dissertation. And it was a, a great, great result. And we've seen actually quite a lot of interest from, uh, from different hospitals in implementing PD. So why is PD important? I mean, again, it's important because heart disease um, in children is chronic, requires lifelong care. Heart surgery is not a cure. Uh, CHD has long-term effects on these patients. And because this is a fast-growing disease population into um, adulthood. Um, moving on to other examples, um, this uh, 
maybe some of you have uh, seen our Invisible Child series. We actually published um, this system, uh, uh, this framework that shows what our pediatric cardiac services need to be available in an ideal healthcare system. And so based on this um, kind of exercise when we, that we published in about 2017 in these pub policy brief uh, briefs, um, we based a um, couple of different um, things that we developed. So the first one is um, the pediatric cardiac care continuum. And this pediatric cardiac care continuum was developed to be uh, used by the state of Kerala in India, where they were implementing uh, newborn screening and um, better referral and follow-up of patients. And so um, the part of the continuum, as you can see, even here, we did not do a very good job of thinking about what happens in adulthood. Uh, follow-up is just one of the, the boxes here after several, you know, finding the patients, referring them appropriately, um, diagnosing them, receiving treatment, transportation and everything. Um, and so when um, our partners in Kerala were implementing it, they actually were trying to expand the use of PD that you just saw from um, about months to three months to six months um, uh, follow-up and to use the same tools for that follow-up. And so um, this, all of this involved the development of this involved regional capacity assessment, um, health worker training. Um, in fact, this happened during the pandemic. And so a lot of the PD education was uh, happening online with a group of community nurses who are seeing some of these patients for um, for follow-up in, um, in the community after they were discharged from surgery. Um, and um, the government really focused on data collection and accountability and um, focusing on quality. Um, again, the measurement of success here was lowering infant mortality, but um, as I showed in one of the papers earlier, that is not sufficient in this day and age. We have to be thinking about longer term. So um, there's definitely more work to be done here. And I will actually quote one of our government uh, partners who was we were working with in Kerala, um, who said, we don't want to lower our infant mortality right now to be increasing our maternal mortality later, um, which is um, kind of scary to think about that if we don't have appropriate maternity care for all these women who are surviving with congenital heart disease, um, it's unfair to them and their families. Um, so the next example are the global recommendations for development of pediatric cardiac services in the healthcare system. So really building up on that first framework from the Invisible Child series that I showed you. So we looked at the level of complexity of care and the different types of facilities that uh, care would be provided um, and whether there's general anesthesia. And basically we made recommendations, what kinds of human resources, uh, what kind of skills those people will have, that workforce will have infrastructure that needs to be available, equipment and supplies, and quality and safety measures. And again, I would say we still did not do a very good job in, in terms of long-term follow-up um, care in our recommendations. So um, here's one example. Um, this is in, um, in level one. Um, no, this is, I'm sorry, I don't see it very well here on my screen. Um, uh, this is the pediatric cardiac um, congenital services in level four. And we had prov a provision of cardiac surgery and catheterization services only in level four and five. Um, and uh, shows you some of the recommendations that we're making here, um, as well as um, in um, level five, which would be a national children's hospital or national heart center, for example, where full range of congenital um, and pediatric cardiac surgery should be provided. Um, we, again, I think we could have done a little bit better job of thinking about how um, adult congenital heart disease and long-term follow-up would be, would be incorporated in, in this field. And so if we do think about that um, in the future, we will um, we'll have to correct it. Um, so the last example for me is going to be, apologies for this, for this sound here. Um, the last example that will be for me is that we have um, right now 22 hospitals that we're working with um, across six countries. And um, 
six of those are um, centers of excellence. And we are going to be surveying our centers of excellence to um, um, to actually provide recommendations for lifelong um, care. So what can NGOs do? Um, to start with a question, um, NGOs could be promoting lifelong care needs and can be talking about that and providing the appropriate education to their centers they're working with, um, as well as the families that they're helping. Um, they could be building capacity for lifelong care, including systems and infrastructure, and they could be partnering with patient and family organizations. I do think that that would be a key um, key success factor um, in this, and I'm sure we could be doing more, and I look forward to the conversation so we can talk more about this. Um, so last, I want to finish with um, this kind of um, graph um, picture showing here is that why is lifelong care important? Well, there's, there's the um, biopsychosocial uh, model in medicine. Um, I think lifelong care is important to be thinking that we don't have just a person with a disease in front of us. Um, that person has social needs and has psychological needs as well. And um, all of the data of um, survivors with congenital heart disease um, are showing, uh, showing us that um, there's a lot of different risks um, outside of just the disease risk and, uh, you know, the actual um, mortality and morbidity risks. Um, patients are um, having to deal with um, social issues and um, like um, job insecurity, for example, um, and are definitely affected by that or psychological issues. Um, and so I do think that uh, thinking about lifelong care is helping us to think holistically about these patients as people who are living life in, in society with different, um, with different types of risks. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And um, I will stop sharing and I will invite uh, Ms. Um, Amy Verstappen to um, uh, start sharing her screen where she will talk about um, uh, how patient and family organizations are thinking about lifelong care. Thank you so much. And I think we'll have time for uh, questions later. Good morning. I'm wondering if you can see what I've got up there. Yes, we can see everything. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So a uh, good morning. I'm very honored to be here today. Um, I'm Amy Verstappen. I'm the president of the Global Alliance for Rheumatic and Congenital Hearts. And I'm here to talk, as Vistra did, about life beyond surgery, planning for lifelong care in low resource settings. Um, as I said, I'm the president of Global Alliance for Rheumatic and I'm going to begin by talking a little bit of who's speaking later. And then I'm going to be talking specific considerations when you're thinking about starting lifelong care. Amy, you are cutting off a little bit. Do you mind turning off your video? I think that. Oh, sound not at all. My apologies. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Is that better? Um, yes, this is great. Global Arch. Um, those of you who are at the last Global Humanitarian Forum actually heard me present about this. At the World Congress in Barcelona in 2017, we convened a leaders uh, summer, summit. We invited 32 patient and family leaders from around the world, and the attendees agreed that there needed to be a global alliance to promote collaboration, shared action, and a common voice on behalf of those living with childhood onset heart disease, both rheumatic and congenital. One of the things we did while we were together is we created a declaration of rights for congenital and rheumatic heart disease. And overwhelmingly, all of us agreed and laid out the idea that lifelong congenital and rheumatic heart care is a basic human right. That each of us has the right to health. It doesn't matter if you were born with a heart defect. And obviously we aren't getting that. We're not really getting that anywhere. And so how could we work together to achieve that? Uh, today, Global Arch has over 60 organizations that are members. So these are patient family organizations. We have other organizations that also can join. 
We're located in over 45 countries now, and we're very proud because more than half of these groups are in low and middle income countries. So if you believe that there aren't patient family organizations for CHD or IHD in low resource settings, that's not true. And we'd love to help you connect with the groups if you don't know of them. The mission of Global Arch is to improve worldwide lifelong outcomes in childhood heart disease through empowering patient and family organizations. And I am not actually going to talk a lot today about Global Arch's specific activities with the groups and what it is the groups do in their communities in general, because Grace Gerald is going to be talking about that after me. What I'm going to focus on now is the specific question on lifelong outcomes and how patient family organizations can help. So I'm gonna start with two stories. So the first story is the story of Ruth Nguaro. Ruth is actually a board member at Global Arch. Ruth was born in 1990 in Kenya where she was diagnosed with a VSD. In 1993, she was very lucky because she connected with Children's HeartLink. Her family could not in any way afford care out of country to help her. And of course, at that time, there was no care options in Nairobi. So she was funded. She traveled to the US. She went to the University of Maryland where she had her VSD closed. They also found some additional mitral problems while she was there and dealt, dealt with that. She went back to Kenya where she felt in general well until she was about eight when she started to have new symptoms. So she was having fatigue and arrhythmia and she went back to Nairobi. And the good news was at that time, Nairobi had developed the capacity to give her a mitral valve replacement. And they actually gave her a mitral valve replacement in country at that time in 2001. She didn't feel perfect, and she reports that she continued to feel fatigue and arrhythmia sort of throughout her childhood and early adulthood, but she continued on. And you can see the picture on the left is her, this is a from a newspaper story when she was a child. The picture on the right is, this is right before she underwent that heart surgery when she was eight. And Ruth continued to be a fighter and an advocate, and she actually was a co-founder of Mended Hearts Kenya. So well, but the Ruth was here. She was lucky that Children's Link got her and got her out, and she was really lucky that she was able to have that new matrix put in a new mitral valve. So in 2019, Ruth moved to Boston, and she was really lucky again because she um, moved to Boston because family were there. She started having critical issues, including arrhythmias. She went to the ER and she was very lucky in that she got referred to the Adult Congenital Heart Program at Boston Children's and the Brigham and Women's. It's a joint program. And when they assessed her, to her surprise, they discovered that she needed a second mitral valve replacement. That valve in there was not working anymore. There, she had additional new valve issues that had to be addressed. And she also had a pacemaker implanted. Ruth's journey since then has not been smooth. She has had three additional hospitalizations over the last, what is that, four years, but she is stable now and she continues now to be a wonderful connected Global Large Board member. And this actually is a picture of her at my wedding two years ago. So this is a story of really good luck and the positive story, the kind of story we want to hear about and the kind of story about what kind of difference a CHD care can make. And I'm gonna tell you a different kind of a story. So last year I got this Facebook message. This was sent via our Global Arch's Facebook page from a young man from Tunisia. He was 27 years old and he had been operated previously for his single defect. He, at that time now, at age 27, he was having severe cardiac decompensation. And he was hoping that we, Global Arch, could help him. Now, of course, Global Arch does not fund surgeries, but we true, do try to connect people and give them strategies. So I emailed with him. He sent me his medical records. He actually still had all his medical records from his initial surgery. And I noticed that 
um, the operation, his initial operation, had been supported both by a medical center in, in France, so he received funding from a French hospital system or foundation, I think it was, affiliated with the hospital. And he also had his surgery done at a major sort of global humanitarian group that continues to, to function in that region. So my first suggestion to him was that he reach out to those groups that had assisted him as a child, and that didn't work at all. So we were emailing back and forth. He said to me that they just refused to help. He had, the other organization ignored him. They didn't even want to see his file engage at all. They're not even willing to look at the records and say if they have any thoughts about what he should do. Um, so at that point, I reached out. I actually had an email for the head of the humanitarian group, and I just confirmed this. I said, you know, blah, 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 there's this person, and what is your policy about this? And I was actually told directly, they confirmed that they didn't ever do any surgeries in anybody over age 18 in any adults, and that was true, that he was not going to get any additional help from him, from them rather. So it was very sad because I had no options to offer this young man. And he was increasingly angry, and I don't blame him. He's very highly educated. He had a degree in biology. He felt like he could get out, and he just wanted an option. And he said, to, said in one of his emails, in fact, his last email, someone who's 27 doesn't have the right to live. It really isn't good to let people die like that. And I think we would all agree that it isn't good. And I want to highlight that we think of this problem of taking care of these adults sometimes as a future problem, but it's actually a now problem because all of you who are listening today, you've been doing what you're doing for a while and you've had a lot of success. And so these individuals, individuals like Muhammad are out there and Ruth. And so we really need to be thinking about how we're going to start dealing with this in low resource settings because of the successes you're having. So I wanted to go over a little how this went in the United States. Um, as some people on the call may know, I ran the Adult Congenital Heart Association for a number of years, starting in about 2000. So I was there for a lot of the development of this approach. So essentially, when we started doing surgeries in about 1960s, sort of mid-century, we really did believe that most of these surger surgeries were truly curative. And part of that was we didn't have data. There had never been adults with these, these who survived with these conditions before, and we didn't expect that there would be a lot of problems with most of the patient population. So easy, you know, ASD, VSD, coarctation. There was really was a belief at that time of one and done. And in fact, if you look at the medical records of people at that time, they were graduated from care. And even who had more complex defects, as I do, there was no emphasis on this idea of the potential of long-term problem. And if you look at this in terms of the balance, you know, there was a concern about future health, but there was bigger concern, I think, about they didn't want to give the families fear or stress, and they also didn't want the patients to be overprotected. So what my family was told is, you know, she's going to do great, go live a normal life. And that really worked well because I did live a normal life. And the large majority of adults who had, or children rather, who had surgery in that era were just lost to care. They left care. But then, starting in the 1990s, and Beaster referenced this, but I want to just look a little bit more granularly at the data, we started getting some really bad news. So as these individuals started to live to adulthood, these first surgeries, survivors started coming up because, of course, the big bump in cardiac surgeries in U.S. and in high-income countries of 1970s, you started to see a lot of unanticipated problems. And in fact, many, many people were needing reoperation. And there seemed to be a pattern where people tended to do pretty well for about 20 years post-initial operation. And then there was a real acceleration of problems, many of them unanticipated. Another big problem, and I think this is still a misperception today, is people had known to worry about the people with more severe CHD, but what we started seeing 
was that even those with the milder defects still had significantly heightened lifelong risks. So this is a study that was done out of public registry data, data in Quebec, Canada. And you can see that the people living with severe CHD had a three time higher risk of one year you know, hospitalization within one year. But even those with mild and moderate disease were twice as likely to be hospitalized in one year than the regular population. So this was really surprising. And just to look a little bit at the data today, to encourage you to think about what does this mean for your patients, both now and the future. This was a, a nice study that came out in 2015. So this is updated information just showing the um, risk-adjusted mortality for uh, the full range of different diseases. So you can see that with the exception of PDA, everybody with repaired congenital heart disease has an increased risk of mortality and it's significantly increased. And I would note that it's funny because of the way this chart works, because it's so, you know, goes out to a 50 fold higher risk. Um, it, you may not appreciate that even if you look at valve, valvular disease or, or, or uh, coarctation, it's still a two times higher risk of dying than your age match, your, your match peers. So you can see that in the simpler defects, we still have a two times greater risk of mortality. It gets much higher, up to five times higher when we get into anybody with a systemic RV. And then obviously when you get up to the front end, you get a 20 fold increase in risk of mortality. And so when we think about the patients that you're taking care of, this is um, data I know yesterday I was lucky to be at the IQIC session and Dr. Jenkins shared their um, RACS you know, scores for the, the patients that had been seen in 2022. And I just wanna note that you know, the majority of the patients are in RACS category one and two, although as you can see from this slide, they're still going to need lifelong care. There's, many of them are still at high risk, but an increasing number are in that much more at risk categorization. Um, and that's going to grow because again, your success is what we're seeing here. So now in starting from 1990 or about 2000 actually to the present, we're really trying to be clear with the families. We're trying to be clear with patients. We're trying to be clear with pa parents that people with congenital heart disease can do very well, but it's never a normal heart and you will need special heart care all of your life. So those are the key messages. It's not just your heart will never be normal, but you'll need special care for you. So what does that care look like, the recommendations in high income countries, just to get a sense of what is it, this model we put together. So this is um, the first recommendations that came out, which uh, were part of this conference report, which happened in 2000. And essentially, it grouped the defects by simple, moderately complex, and highly complex, and what the follow-up needs were. Essentially, I want to just highlight that none of these defects did they say they don't need to be followed up. Really, the only question is where they should be followed up. So in the simplest possible lesions, simplest possible operations, follow-up every three to five years was recommended in general cardiology. And when you get to moderately complex, and I don't mean moderately complex in terms of rack scores. Sometimes people, surgeons particularly, will think, oh, these things aren't complex. They're not complex surgically. But in terms of the risks in as you age, they are there, it's very significant and they're more complex. So this could be an ASD and a VSD plus any other issue. So any other valve issue, a more complex valve disease, cartation, tetralogy. ACHD follow-up was rec recommended every two years, and very importantly, pre-pregnancy consults, because as I'm sure everybody here knows, as you age, you can develop problems that you don't even feel. For example, a stenotic valve that will not be harmful to you when you're not pregnant, but will really be harmful if you get pregnant. And to have all cardiac procedures done at a center that specializes in ACHD care. 
And then for the highly complex defects, it's recommended yearly follow-up. The pregnancy should be managed in collaboration with that center and for anesthesia. It's a very intense follow-up to make sure that those people live as long as they can. And here's the aspirational staffing guidelines. Okay, and as a person who was there often in these conversations when we talked about it, this was meant to be aspirational. This is in the best of all possible worlds. I'm not gonna read all these things, but here is what you would have. You need those multiple surgeons, cardiologists, all that other staff, and you need all those extensive services, in it, including obstetrics because as Bistra highlighted, these are patients who are gonna get pregnant and do have a high risk of maternal mortality or much higher than the general population. So this is essentially what was set out in 2000. Since then, there's been two US sets of guidelines published. I encourage you to look at them. Um, there have been tweaks. They've changed the way they rate def defects a little bit, but in general, this is still the, the, the approach of all the existing ACHD care guidelines both in high income countries, you know, Europe, all of those countries around the world. And the other really exciting thing is we've been able to show that ACHD care is significantly connected to lower mor mortality and morbidity. So we can show now that this kind of care really prevents problems and helps people live longer. Okay, so I just told you a whole ideal situation. Um, and as I say, I started at ACHA in 2000, I left in 2013. A lot of the work I did at that organization was really thinking about how do we create a care model. So how are we doing? And the short answer to how this care model is doing in high income countries is it's not working very well. So despite what you may hear, the minor minority of people in high income countries are actually getting recommended ACHD care. So with the reported about 24% of European patients and 12% of US patients, that's some numbers that have been thrown around. Um, and then the really striking thing is that the majority of patients that are lost to care leave before age 12. So the interesting thing about this is this model was set up imagining people continuing in pediatric care and then transitioning to an adult congenital heart program. And that's actually not what's happening. People are dropping before then in the US well before then. So one recent study found that 47% found that of the patients had left care before age five. So essentially we spent a lot of effort. We created a really aspirational system that is very high quality and can work, but there is not a lot of pickup in terms of who is actually using it. And so what are the barriers? We could talk all day about all kinds of barriers, but I just wanna note a few of them that I think are particularly relevant as you think about um, planning for long-term care in your country. So first of all, I would say that this idea that the cure really persists, and I think part of that has to do with human nature that the truth is most children with most kind of defects do really well. So a family might take their child back to care, you know, for a few years and then the kid is fine. They look like I did when I was little. They're running around, they're well, they don't have symptoms and they figure great, they're fixed. So it might be that the clinician has been very clear with them that they're not, but this is something we all want. We want our, we want our child to be well and so they leave. As Beaster noticed, there is still a shortage of this kind of specialty care. Obviously, it's very expensive. It requires extensive training. So it's just going to be hard to have enough for it. But I also just want to note that the model we created requires people to travel to tertiary care. And that is very different, difficult for patients who are living their life. It's time, it's loss of work, it's expensive. And this model is expensive also to the healthcare system. So if you think about it, it uses a lot of very high level technologies and is really, it's expensive. Okay, so what's the barriers in the places where you all work? Well, first of all, just obviously, there are virtually no ACHD programs in low and middle income countries right now. This was a study that was done I believe in 2015, which just looked at ACHD programs, if they were there at all in low and middle income countries. And I will note that the metric they used was not a program, but 
was this place publishing any research on adults with congenital heart disease? And you can see basically that right now, this is something that only exists in high income countries. I will note that some of the some places are starting ACHD clinics, which is great. And in Amrita, they just opened their first formal ACHD program. And I know in India, Anita Saxena has been a long term advocate. There are people who are working on these programs and we can learn from them. But it's hard and it, it's, it's not just about the absence of ACHD providers. The biggest barrier is right now we have a situation, as we all know, where we we are not even offering people primary repair. And so obviously that's the focus right now is to provide life-saving surgery. And, and I don't think anyone here this morning is trying to say that that shouldn't be your focus. Obviously, you can't get somebody to one, you can't get them to 18 or 30 or 60. And there's already a severe shortage of staff, infrastructure and funding in pediatric cardiology. The other issue is there's minimal post-operative follow-up. This is something that gets reported, and you can see from Bistra's presentations, 30-day um, outcomes is considered sort of the, the thing we tend to focus on, maybe a year, but really this idea that the importance of continuing through childhood is lacking. And, and again, there's not a lot of resources. Obviously, if you've been cared for either with a visiting team or not in your country, there is not going to be facilities near you that, it, that can take care of your congenital heart needs. And then as I noticed when I was talking about Muhammad, the truth is that much of the charitable and NGO care is often restricted to children. And then the last thing I'll say is that there's really still, I find, a continuing awareness of what is needed. So I hear the phrase one and done used a lot still. And I hope I've convinced you that there's really no such thing as one and done. And I should say that one of the common things that happens with adults with congenital heart disease is that they were told when they were children, often by their surgeon, that that was their last surgery. And when they're adults, when they need a reoperation, they really feel lied to. They're, they're shocked. They said, but they promised me I would never need new surgery. So just remember, many people do. And we need to think differently about this. But I also think that as you all take this on, you have a huge opportunity to avoid our mistakes. I would say that when I look at the model now that was created, sort of 10 years later, 15 years later, I really think that in some ways it's the it, not quite the wrong approach, but but um, we need a more realistic model. Because first of all, it's easy to communicate surgery is not a cure. So you, you are ahead of us because you know that when we started doing surgeries in high income countries, we didn't know that. But you have an opportunity to focus on retention starting in childhood, because that's where we're having the problem in the high income countries as well. And right now we know that post-operative follow-up is a challenge. Beaster talked about that. So maybe that's a place to start. It's just thinking about how are you making sure that the children you're operating now are coming back regularly after their surgery. <laughs> the other thing I would say is there's a real opportunity to focus more on an approach that is not so tertiary care-based. Because as I said, this is a huge barrier. People don't want to go. They're not going to be referred. And I think that certainly the lesson of of COVID is that there are a lot of ways to do things remotely that do not require this kind of in-person tertiary care that could be real strategies to do this. And we're really looking forward to you all on this call, helping us identify them. We also just don't have enough research. There's virtually nothing if you look at the study on what's going on. We don't know who's in care, how long they stay in care, what's the age of the patients, what are parents being told, what's your current practice, what are the NGO policies, and we need to learn more about all these things if we want to improve this. So now I'm going to switch to sort of introduce Grace's section. We also believe that it's very important that as we solve this problem, congenital heart patient organizations are engaged, that they can be a resource and really help this happen. This is a, a graphical abstract for an article that I 
Sheila Ross and I just published in the Canadian Journal of Cardiovascular Medicine on the role of patient organizations. And I think that these groups do many, many things can support lifelong health. Um, in terms of social support and connection, we know that stressed and anxious people don't go back to care. They don't adhere with care. And we also know that if you have groups that get together, the parents with the patients, this is very helpful because it gives them a window into the future. It gives them cross-age connections. They can have that, that ongoing support as they go up that when they do need things, they'll know where it is and they'll know what it looks like. Specific education can be done by the groups on risk factors. So um, it can be more sophisticated like the guidelines. So the Adult and Heart Association educates people a lot about that risks of pregnancy, these are all activities that the patient associations do in country, and Grace will be talking more about that. And advocacy. So there's lots of advocacy that the patient organizations do around this issue. So first of all, I will note that there's a huge issue that health insurance, even governments that cover CHD care, the coverage often maybe usually ends at age 18. So for example, the Hridium project in Kerala, you, you don't get the care for free when people reach age 18. And that's actually something that I know the advocates there are working on. And I recently had a meeting there with them and a health, health um, department official is, how can we change it so that those children that have been taken care of so carefully by Hridium continue to thrive and continue to be able to access care after they turn age 18. Um, Chile actually ends benefits at 15, and there's a picture of the group meeting trying to get that changed. I think that the other issue is access to disability benefits and access to ACHD care. So I know in Bulgaria, they don't have ACHD care. They've been advocating very aggressively around this. And then on the global arena, really thinking about including CHD care in universal health coverage. So making sure that as we raise the profile of congenital heart disease globally with the multilateral organizations, we're not just talking about this as an infant mortality issue. And this is a picture of Belen Blanton, who's another Global Arch board member, talking at the UN General Assembly at a meeting that we co-hosted on her lifelong needs as a person living with congenital heart disease. And we will continue to include all of that messaging always about lifelong care. So how can you help now? So here's my action points, if you will. Obviously, the clearer you can be in your communications and your understanding that this is not curative, the better. I know that's been said many times this so far, but I will say that many, many of our parent leaders, when they arrive at Global Arch, they believe that most surgeries are curative. So this cannot be said enough, cannot be repeated enough. If you're thinking about starting this, or think, I would, you know, as I said, I think one place that's really obvious is just thinking about post-operative care, like what's going on with that and how, you know, not you know, extending that in terms of that, you know, that child you operated on five years ago, where are they? Giving patients, families really clear information. So where might they be able to find care if there are any resources, how often, what they should look for? And obviously start thinking about, we understand that the large majority of centers in low resource settings don't have the resources to get anywhere near creating ACG programs as we have in high income countries. But how can you start planning for that? Because that's your success. Your success is creating this population. And the final thing, and I know this is quite controversial, but I would really in encourage all of you to consider the lifelong needs of that patient before you perform a surgery. If this is a family that is in a region that has no realistic access to post-surgical care, let alone adult congenital heart care, that should be, I believe, an ethical consideration in doing that, that repair, um, at least realistically understanding what the lifespan of that child might be if this repair is done. So thank you.
With that, I'm going to turn the mic, if you will, over to Grace to tell you a little bit more about, about Global Arch and the various activities in country of our patient and family organizations. So thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. This was a very comprehensive and um, excellent presentation. Grace, are you ready to share your slides? Yeah. Amy, can you stop sharing, please? Yes. Can everybody see this? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. You can start. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Grace, and I am going to be talking about the global impact of patient organizations. Um, so yes, I'm Grace Gerald, and I am the founder of CHD Malaysia, which is Congenital Heart Defects Malaysia. I'm also a board member in Global Arch as well. And just a little bit about myself is I am a patient and I have congenital heart disease. I have um, transposition of the great arteries. So I've gone through a few different surgeries for that. And I've also um, go have a pacemaker. And so this um, patient organization is dear to my heart because, you know, um, I've always wanted to know other peers. And one of the reasons why I founded the one in Malaysia is because I'm sure there were others out there like me that needed peer support and, you know, someone that would actually understand what they're going through. Um, and so this is my next slide. As um, you know, like Amy shared earlier, um, Global Arch has many different patient organizations around the world. Um, as you can see, the little red dots, it's all the different patient organizations that are part of Global Arch. But as you can see, there are still many countries that um, need to be reached to, and there are still many other patient organizations out there that would, be, would love to be part of Global Arch as well. And so I just want to share a little bit with you about um, the rights to health. Uh, for every childhood onset heart disease. So we should have the right to heart care that is affordable, accessible, safe, high quality, patient-centered, and lifelong. We should also have the right to well-being, including protection from stigma, social inclusion, education, employment, medical privacy, and social benefits. So these are the things that patients with congenital heart disease, we feel like we have the right to all this health. And so, you know, you could help us by signing the Declaration of Rights of Individuals right at the Global Arch um, website as well. So now I'm just gonna be sharing a little bit more about what um, our groups do. So firstly, we provide peer support. Um, we combat fear and thinking I'm alone because Nobody needs to feel like they're on this journey alone. Um, we promote well-being. We combat loneliness. So a few different a few different organizations actually help with mental health. Um, they actually provide uh, mental health uh, counseling. Uh, we also help to fight stigma because there is a lot of stigma um, with regarding to children with congenital heart. And growing up with it, you you actually get labeled, and nobody should be labeled and you know um, everyone has the, the the right to live and so we we fight stigma we, we try to change society's opinions about patients with chd and lastly we actually have a lot of fun so as you can see with the different pictures um, of the different support groups um, that are part of global arch and the different activities that we do um yeah it's actually quite fun and you get to meet a lot of other people and you get to share different stories with them as well so a little bit of what I do in Malaysia. Um, so I just started the group about two years ago, and we actually provide a lot of um, peer support in our Facebook pages where people are just sharing their stories. Um, you know, they're just asking help, they're asking information from other parents. You know, everyone's just helping each other. Um, these are some, some of the photos of um, my peers which you know, I never knew growing up that people of my age had um, this condition, but it's just nice to, you know, you, you meet people for the first time and you kind of instantly click because you have something in common and you know, you just, you understand the problems that they go through and you know, it's just there to help each other. You know, somebody poses a question and instantly you get like so many comments replying because everybody understands, everybody's just there to support each other as well. 
And what we also do is um, we provide patient education globally. So we have webinars, we have print materials, we have peer education, and it's just so to educate the public on um, patient education. And so different societies do patient education just so people are aware of, um, you know, what they can, what they can't do, you know, they have education because we have people from different demographics, different social economies, and, you know, we just help. And sometimes we help translate into languages that people um, actually can understand because, you know, we can't just take it for granted that everyone understands English, but, you know, we have uh, we have all these materials and we try to do it in their own native language so that, you know, they actually um, be able to use this education uh, materials. And so these are some of the things um, I have done in Malaysia. We did um, educational webinars. We also um, collaborate with other organizations. So we're not, not doing this alone. Um, you know, it helps us to collaborate with other organizations to, to, to educate um, patients about the difference. So we've done some like about COVID vaccines and about pacemakers and, you know, life after congenital heart. And so um, we just want to educate the, the people and we've tried to do it in the native language so that people um, are, who attend understand it. And um, yeah, these are some of the examples that we have done. And we found that education, uh, patient education is actually very important because some people um, grow up thinking that, oh, I'm fixed. Um, and so the lack of education has um, resulted in um, more severe kind of um, damage because depending on, like I said, um, different social economies, different backgrounds that they come from, you know, and so they're just not aware of um, what they need to do and what they need to look after themselves. And so these webinars um, actually help them to know that, you know, um, that I can do this and I can do that. And it just helps to educate them as well. Um, we also have um, organizations that help patients with funding. Um, we help families raise funds. We connect families with funders like the Rotary Cup and many different organizations that provide funding. We find surgical centers and we also have organizations that purely just assist with transportation because, you know, people might, sometimes a patient might live in a secluded area or in an area that um, has issues accessing transport. And so um, my, my organization personally, we do not um, do that. And one of the reasons is because we're still working to get our legal status, but there are many different organizations in Global Arch, like um, the Pakistan's Children Hospital, KDS, Braveheart, uh, Fun, Little Heart South Africa. All these amazing um, groups were actually founded by CHD parents. And so they're actually helping other parents find funding for their children and um, they're helping other patients. And so this is some of the things that um, patient family organizations can do. We also help support research. And so we recruit participants, we fund research, um, we partner on research and we input on research priorities. So these are the different um, researchers that we have been a part of. And, um, and we, we do this because, you know, research gives us the data that we need. And so this is some of the things that we do. Um, we also help and help engage with the government. Um, and, you know, as Amy mentioned um, earlier, that's the importance of engaging with the government and, you know, trying to to get help um, and trying to get more, uh, not just funding, but um, accessibility to, to um, it to for adults with congenital heart so that the, the lifelong care doesn't just end um, as a kid. And so these are some of the different organizations in Peru, in Brazil, and even in Zimbabwe, where they're meeting with the different government officials um, to talk about this, to raise awareness about um, congenital heart disease and what their patient groups can offer. And um, right here in Malaysia, what we, um, we have done is we have met with the Director General of Health in Malaysia. 
Um, I've also um, been a represent met with representatives from the World Bank, and so we're trying to engage with the government because we need to do this hand in hand. Um, it's not just something a patient's family group can do on their own, but with everybody working together, it's a kind of a hand in hand thing um, to to together help raise awareness about congenital heart defects. And um, we also have different campaigns um, run by Global Arch for CHD and RHD rights campaign. Um, we have endorsements, um, awareness campaigns through social media. Um, we use um, government and policy makers. And so um, we really want to raise awareness, um, especially through social media, about um, CHD and RHD rights. And so the question is, how you can help. You can help us to connect with patient and family organizations. As I said earlier, there are still many patients and family organizations um, that are not part of Global Arch that we're not aware of, um, but you can help us connect with them because I'm sure they too are doing a marvelous work um, in the world of CHD. Um, you can also help us by identifying and support new groups and leaders. Um, we can also include people living with CHD in existing ad activities like advisory groups, um, engagement and input in research, and in advocacy. So we would love for you to, you know, just partner with us um, to just let us know how you can help us and connect us and together we can do um, a difference. You can also um, take action. So, you know, what's next, right? You can sign up at globalarch.org. Um, you can endorse the declaration at Global Arch. Um, we need professional societies and humanitarian groups. You can get involved in regional networks. We have a few different regional networks. We have a regional network in Asia. We have a regional network in Africa. You know, you could get involved. We could work together. Um, you could also follow us on Instagram, um, on Twitter, and, you know, on the different social media platforms. And, um, you know, we like I said, it's a hand-in-hand -hand thing. It's not just a Global Arch thing or the patient advocacy groups. Um, together with humanitarian groups, with the government, it's a hand-in-hand -hand thing that we can do together. And, um, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. And, you know, as it says here, every heart deserves a long and full life. And so let's do this together to ensure that. And, yeah, thank you so much for listening. And I'll pass the time back to Bistra. Thank you so much, Grace. This was a wonderful presentation to hear about how patients um, and families family members can be advocating and can be making a change. Uh, I think both you and Amy are great examples of that. Um, and I also want to say that Grace was very uh, modest. She comes from a line of advocacy in this space. Her mom um, actually started a, a, a very successful patient support and fundraising group at the hospital where Grace was operated. And um, uh, Grace has written about this, been interviewed, and another important thing to say is that she was actually the first successful TGA done in her country. And so I think that's a um, important thing. And I'm sure it's not easy to be, you know, bearing that um, kind of sort of title. Um, we will move on to our next speaker, which is um, Dr. Ignacio Lugones. And Dr. Lugones, if I'm not mistaken, you're from Buenos Aires, uh, from Argentina. Um, so you will share a little bit about um, uh, the uh, uh, work that you do in your country. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and honor. I hope you can see my screen. Please let me know. Yes, we can. Well, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, congratulations to my, my previous speakers. You were wonderful. Uh, well, the idea of this uh, short presentation is to tell you a bit more of what is happening in South America uh, in terms of humanitarian pediatric heart surgery. Uh, as I told you, I'm Ignacio Lugones. I'm the head of the unit of congenital heart surgery uh, uh, in the Children's Hospital of Buenos Aires. Well, uh, before getting uh, in depth into the humanitarian missions, I first would like to know, to to show you a bit of the situation, uh, general situation of South America. As you can see here, this is South America. Uh, South America is a land of contrasts. It's a beautiful uh, place. 
uh, full of diversity, nature. Uh, you will see in this map that uh, it, the Amazonas has a huge presence in the in the continent, and we also have uh, the Andes Mountains. And to the south, at the southern part of Argentina and Chile, we have the famous Patagonia too. And this land full of diversity is home for 440 million people. Uh, people you usually mainly live uh, along the coast because in the inner part of the continent you have forest. So, uh, and it's located mainly, concentrated ma mainly in the largest cities, which are, for example, Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil, Montevideo, Buenos Aires, Santiago in Chile and Lima in Peru, Quito and Guayaquil are two of the main cities in, in Ecuador. And we have in Colombia, Bogota and, and Cali, and we have Caracas. And all these people uh, is located in, in these areas. And the main languages that are spoken and basically Spanish, remember we were a, Spanish, a colony from Spain, and in Brazil, particularly Portuguese. Of course, there are other languages spoken, mostly Amerindian languages, but the general language that is spoken are, are spoken are uh, English and, and Portuguese. Uh, relate, in relation to the ethnic groups, we have uh, Amerindians, in, you can see them in yellow, mainly located in Bolivia, Peru, and Ecuador. We have uh, black people that can be depicted in pink, we have uh, white people in the southern part of, of Argentina and Uruguay, and we have also mestizos and mulatos. Uh, regarding the economic status, more or less 30% of the population lives in poverty. Uh, nowadays, we are suffering a huge economic crisis here in Argentina, and more or less, uh, unfortunately, more or less 50% of the population is, is living in poverty. Uh, and regarding religion, more, more than 80% of the population is Christian. And what about health systems in South America? Well, I could find two words to describe health systems in South America. They are uneven and they are fragmented. Basically, basically we have four subsystems. The main system is the public health system, the government, uh, which is financed by the state and the federal or regional authority defines the budget for healthcare. Of course, it is universal. Everyone can have free access to all levels of the system. And of course, the entire population is eligible. And of course, again, centers are overburned because people do not have money and they tend to go to this kind of hospitals. This system is very strong in countries like Argentina, Brazil, and Venezuela. Then we also have the private health insurance, which is purchased by house, households and firms. And the customer can choose between different companies that provide health care. And of course, the, the, the objective of these associations is to earn money. And we also have the mandatory health insurance, which is a, a system in which de dependent workers and retirees are mandated to spend by law a, cent a certain percentage of their salaries, uh, which goes to, to the financiation of the poorest people in the system. And finally, we have uh, very few people that can afford the direct out-of-pocket payments in which you pay, basically you pay for the service, the service you get. doesn't move or does, doesn't have it. But what about congenital heart disease care? Well, this is a paper from 2011. Uh, this is the last uh, update on the general situation of South America in terms of, of congenital heart diseases. Uh, as you can see, in more than 10 years, we have increased our population in 50%. Now we are 440 million people. And of those people, more or less 80,000 80, children are born with a congenital heart defect each year in the region. Half of them will need surgery each year. And now this is when it comes, uh, the, the most important things. In this column, you can see the last column on the right, you can see the number of surgeries that are performed each year in each country. 
And if you compare them to the previous column, you will see, which is the number of new searches that are required each year, you will see that these numbers are relatively similar. For example, in Argentina, it, there are needed more or less 3,800 surgeries and more or less 3,000 are performed. The same happens in Chile and Uruguay. That means that a high proportion of patients that need surgery really receive surgery. The opposite happens in other countries of the region, which are Peru, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Paraguay. As you can see in these countries, the, there is a huge gap between those patients that need surgery and those ones that receive surgery. For example, in Bolivia, you have more or less uh, 1,400 patients needing surgery, and you can only provide 250 patients, surgeries per year. So the proportion of patients that get attention is very low. Somewhere in the middle are Brazil and Colombia. And the reason for that is that it's mainly uh, due to the fact that these countries are, especially Brazil, are massive countries. So, and the geography makes some areas of these countries really inaccessible. It must be remembered that Amazonas, the Amazonas covers a huge part of Brazil. So several places uh, do really become inaccessible, especially during, during certain seasons. So overly, we perform more or less 50% of the operations that are needed in the region. When you look at the, the, the same can be reflected by the number of surgeries that are performed per million inhabitants. Again, Argentina, Chile and Uruguay perform more than 70 surgeries per million people. And the opposite happens in Uruguay, in Paraguay, Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru and Venezuela. You can see that here that more or less 20 surgeries are being performed per million people in these countries. So there is a huge need of patients in those, of surgery in those areas. The burden then is the lack of coverage, particularly in these countries, which is above 70 to 80 percent. This is in correlation with the fact that there is a low number of surgeons and centers that are being uh, that are working in these uh, countries. As you can see, there is a, this, uh, an uneven distribution of surgeons in the different countries. For example, in Argentina, congenital heart surgery has been uh, has been developed mainly by Dr. Guillermo Kreutzer, one of the inventors of the Fontaine Kreutzer procedure. And he left a, a very important school of congenital heart surgery. And in fact, the residency here is a primary level residency. So as soon as you get out of the university, you can enter your pediatric cardiac surgery residency. In fact, now I'm 40, uh, 46 years old and I operated on my first patient, my PDA closure when I was 25. So. I'm, well, I consider myself still young, uh, but I still, but I have 20 years ex of experience in, in congenital heart diseases. But it does, this doesn't happen in some other countries. In fact, there are several countries in the area that do not have a training program for those surgeons. So, and they also do not have the centers where they can perform these cases. So, that, that is a huge problem for, for the region. But there are good news. Uh, and the good news are that surgeons from these countries are being trained abroad, and then they come back to, to their countries and they are starting their own programs in their own countries. That is very good. For example, we receive a lot of surgeons from Bolivia, um, from Peru, and from Paraguay. For example, that they come here and they train and they, they get back to their countries to try to start their own units. Uh, there is a lot, uh, awareness is, is, is growing here in the population and laws are being approved to force the governments to create and support strategies to improve congenital heart disease care. 
And an, a good example of that is the law for compre pro comprehensive care of people born with a congenital heart defect that was recently approved here in Argentina. And there you can see some of the of the very important people that that were behind that. Uh, besides that, programs to organize congenital heart disease care are being developed and or improved. And a good example of that is what is happening in Argentina. The, there is a program here that is uh, supported by the World Bank by which several centers are supported around uh, throughout the country uh, to perform congenital heart defects. And as you can see, they are categorized in different levels of complexity, but the whole country is covered. You, remember that Argentina is a very big country. It's a very wide country. So we need to have centers uh, throughout the country in order to provide perfect or, or, or good congenital cardiac care. The same happens in other countries like Uruguay. Uruguay is a very small country, but they do have two pediatric and congenital heart surgery units uh, in both in the private and in the public sector. And uh, in fact, some surgeons from Argentina go there to, to perform search in the more complex cases. In some regions, for example, the percentage of undiagnosed and untreated patients is decreasing. A good example of that is also, again, Argentina, with this program, we have been able to reduce the waiting list to a very small waiting list. And, and well, things are improving in terms also of results because we are also improving our results in the country thanks to this program and to the training that our, our surgeons receive. For example, as you can see here, the overall mortality for congenital heart defects in 2022 was 6% in the whole country. So this is a relatively good result, a quite good result for a, for a country that is not relatively well developed in terms of economic, uh, of the economic situation. And now I wanted to make that introduction in order for you to to understand where and why do humanitarian missions go where they go. So basically, Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile have their cardiac services rel relatively covered. So they do not receive uh, important missions to treat patients with congenital heart defects. The other countries do receive uh, on the opposite because they have uh, really important needs in terms of congenital heart defect surgery. I will try to give a, a, an overview of, of uh, an actualization of what is going on in terms of humanitarian missions in this country. For example, in Bolivia, with a population of 12 million, more or less 2,000 children are born with a congenital heart defect each year, and less than 5% receive medical attention. So humanitarian missions play a big role there because they go to certain hospitals to perform surgery and they also try to uh, empower those centers to become independent. And they also provide uh, supplies to make those, those centers grow. For example, Gift of Life does three to four surgical missions each year in the Children's Hospital of La Paz. Uh, there, they have also provided uh, the echo machine and the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, among other supplies. The unit is the largest unit in the country, and it is headed by uh, Erika Perez Albrecht. Uh, she's a surgeon and a good friend, and they perform more or less 10 patients per year. <clears throat> uh, more or less... Uh, 40% of those 100, 100 patients are being done by uh, humanitarian missions that go there. And the center is growing, it's growing fast, and, and they are being able to operate on, on more patients each month. Uh, all, also in, in Bolivia, in Santa Cruz de la Sierra, another big city uh, in the eastern part of the country, in the, at the INCOR clinic, 
Texas volunteers have gone there and have performed a couple of missions. And also in Cochabamba, the same team from La Paz uh, in the Belgium hospital has done, uh, we, al along with a, a foundation from Germany, a few cases of Epstein's disease, which is a prevalent disease there in, in that country. And uh, moving forward to Paraguay, Paraguay is one of the areas that needs most assistance. Uh, most they have seven, there are seven millions and 1,500 children are born with a congenital heart disease each year. And the, more or less 10, 1,000 uh, operations are needed and less than two, uh, 300, two to 300 are being performed. Uh, more or less one patient that is not urgent can wait for two or three years to undergo surgery. There we have uh, Dr. Uh, Nancy Garay. She's uh, a cardiologist and she founded the, the uh, unit at the Acosta New Children's Hospitals, which is located in San Lorenzo, just outside the, the, the country's capital city. There they have uh, 10 ICU beds and they perform more or less 100 surgeries each year. Uh, they have received missions from Surgeons of Hope, headed by Juan Miguel Gil Jaurena from the Marañón Children's Hospital. And also Dominique Metras has gone there. Mendicates is providing critical supplies. And up to now, Surgeons of Hope have, has performed three missions for complex cases. But there is not much more in the country in terms of congenital heart disease care. Uh, that is the reason why missions perform less than 5% of the cases, and there is a lot of need in that country. When we go move to Ecuador, Ecuador is other one of the of the of the countries that really needs assistance. It is a big country, it has 70, um, 17 million people, more or less 2,500 children are born with a congenital heart defect each year, and mainly two, in, main, in two main cities, uh, uh, care is being provided. Uh, the Novi Cardiac Alliance has performed more than 20 million to Quito, and this organization has had a, a huge prevalence in the in the region, and they have gone. They have been in Paraguay, in Peru, in Bolivia, in Venezuela, and Brazil in the past. But now they are only focusing on Ecuador. Uh, also in Guayaquil, CardioStart and Fundación El Cielo para los Niños, that is Foundation The Sky for the Children of Ecuador. They have performed a couple of missions in, in, in the Children's Hospital, uh, Dr. Francisco de Casa. And also Dr. Sean Myers has been there, um, has been there several times. Peru uh, also receives missions, not that many, more or less 6,000 children are born with a congenital heart def uh, defect each year and missions, uh, different foundations, she also have been there like Novi Cardiac Alliance, it's heart to heart and Cardio Start has been there in, in Arequipa. All the other missions are mainly located in Lima. And uh, Colombia, Venezuela, Guyana, Northern Brazil, they receive few missions. I haven't been able to collect too much data about those countries because they, they receive a scarce mission. So uh, there is a lot of need there, particularly in Venezuela and Guyana. Colombia has uh, a school, a pediatric cardiac surgery school <clears throat> that is very good and they are <clears throat> growing fast uh, uh, along the years. So which are the <clears throat> take home messages? Well, in South America, each country and each region have their own reality. And there is much collective effort that is needed to improve the quality of life of those patients with congenital heart defects. But the good thing, <clears throat> sorry, is that people are requesting answers. There is a lot of awareness regarding this, this uh, complex uh, malformations and love, compassion and compromise provided by healthcare workers, along with support from governments with laws and programs are key factors to change this reality. And humanitarian missions must continue, and it could be glad. I could be glad to hear that they are growing in terms of quantity on patients that are being operated that, that can be operated on, and they are playing a significant role in some countries. But of course, more sustained support is needed. 
with a special focus in training and education. What we want is the local teams to grow and to become independent in order to provide surgical congenital heart disease care to the patients of their countries. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lugones. I appreciate uh, this a very good overview. Um, I'm not sure our last um, speaker is here. Um, waiting for the organizers to tell me. We do have a couple of videos from what I understand that will be played. Are we ready to do that? Or should we move on to our question and answer session? part of the session. Okay. So I think we have two videos with um, patient experience. Um, do you mind playing those? My name is Matelita. I'm from Otoka. We live in Rifle Range. My daughter's name is? Evelyn. First of August, we had a very bad fever. Like two days, I get sick. Then the another two days, I get again sick. I vomit, I have high fever. Like, it was like slowly, slowly getting worse. So we were in Lotoka Hospital. I told the doctor that uh, she's been through this for how many days. We don't know why. This doctor, she understand like mom's feeling. Eh? So I tell her, I can't see her like this. Then the doctor tell us that day, what about we give you the number? We'll send all this x-ray and everything. You go to the children's ward. And the doctor was there, Dr. Yogas and Dr. Yogas check everything. Then Dr. Yogas said that your daughter have two holes in the heart. So we need to do something and we need to operate that. When he said operation, I started to cry and crying and crying. At home, I always tell that my mom, I don't want to do this. I don't like this. But then she told me you have to do this. This is for your life. I believe that there is nothing here without a reason in life. And that there is a reason for us to be here, to be able to have uh, little babies. Conchita heart disease is one of those issues that if you are able to solve the problem, um, then you turn someone's life uh, from one direction to a completely different direction. I, mean, I feel so privileged that we are working with amazing medical professionals from around the world who volunteered their time. All these people who are coming are not coming for money because they're not getting paid, but these are good human beings and good professionals who feel that they can contribute and because they care. It's why you do medicine, you know? I think anyone can achieve competency if you train hard enough, but not many places give you the chance to practice compassion to this level. I was like so super duper scared. When I had my operation, when I woke up, I was like so scared. I didn't know what will come next. I tell my mom every day and crying that this won't work for me. I can't do this. It's so painful in my heart. Like small babies do this. How do they feel? Today, I don't know what just happened, changed my mind. I was eating food and listening to the doctors and helping the nurse to go with the dishes. It just flew my mind away. This place is so beautiful. When I stepped in to this place, I was scared, but then I looked around and around. I was like thinking, is this a hotel or what? 
His face is so amazing. Like the big heart was there. I was like, this looks like a hotel. Am I in a hotel? Or it's just I'm dreaming. This hospital is a gem for a number of uh, reasons. The hospital is planned with a very detailed vision how patient care is going to be organized. I asked the doctor, doctor, we need to do something. We need to get her finance because nowadays finance is very hard for the parents. Eh? But especially when you come there, when they tell you operation, you will think, how I'm going to do this? How I'm going to do that? They tell us that uh, we're going to do the surgery. Everything will be free. Mom and the baby, they're going to stay in one room. Everything's fine there. You don't have to worry about anything. Then me and my husband, and we sit down. We were so happy that day. This is not really a very, very cheap investment for those babies. Uh, you use a lot of equipment, uh, consumables, uh, quite a big workforce. So that's not really very cheap in terms of the finances, but this hospital provides all these services for free, which is amazing. If this place wasn't here, what would we do? We had to collect money, go to overseas, and it would be like so hard. So that's why I think to this place, it saved all the kids. Hospitals are the uh, places where we have a lot of medical infrastructure, a lot of equipment. These are uh, the places of cure. But we often forget about the human element of it, which is care. But this hospital combines cure and care in one. And that's, I think, a very, very unique feature. This place do everything to us. Even when we come here, the staff from the first day till today, they're all very kind. The mothers here, that's the other big reason why I felt it was a very important mission. I saw their pain when they brought their child to the echo. And after the surgery, they would bring the same child for a follow-up echo. And they looked completely different. My daughter's operation done. And I'm so happy that from now on, I won't know that my daughter's sick. I will see my daughter that she's a strong young girl. I just want to say thank you, the team here, and everybody. The very first day when we arrived in that door, where that big girl, it's very special for me. It's because my daughter's life, they say, are here. So I will never forget this place. Look, my daughter's happy today. She don't want to go back home just because of the people here. They are so kind. I wish I can yeah. stay here mm -hmm. like forever and ever. Don't want to leave. I just want to stay here. So once again, um, thank you for all the doctors who will heal the kids and make them strong and have a good life again. And when I grow up, I want to like work here. Because this place is the amazing and the best place I ever been through. I don't want to be a teacher anymore. I think you just changed my mind now. I want to be a heart surgeon. Yeah. My name is uh, Enirita uh, Lekima Tulanga. I'm from uh, Tuvalu. This is Susie Maya uh, Luduleva. She's my daughter, and uh, I'm married to a Fijian. The father's name is Lekima Rekevalu. He's from uh, Nakorosulaneta City. The time before when I found out that uh, she has the thing on the heart like that, she had always had this problem of um, the pneumonia. We came here and then Dr. Mary and Monita from there. She's scared of it, but uh, she said she trusts us. But anything that is come near to her, and then she said, I want to see you in that hospital. That's where we know the hospital. I know, I can see, I had the news about the hospital, but I never been just go near or just enter, I never been there. 
Dr. Marianne is uh, doing some appointment with my daughter there. The lungs are all flat with the thing, it's all wet, so it can't. To do something to generate some fund just for her. And while we, because of uh, doing the eye, like, it's, really, it's a relief of uh, coming in a clinic in that hospital of uh, Sai Burma. You know, the, the burden that I carry when I reach there, the way they explain, it's given me something, a hope that, uh, you know, my daughter can be well. And myself, because they look at her, she's healthy. Just now, when she kept uh, those medicine for the heart and every day, I trust um, those people, they said, that we have to fix before it's too late. That feeling, I, to be honest, on that same moment, like I said uh, before, I cried cried of many reasons. First, I can't afford if they said this and this. Second, I don't know what to do because I don't understand how, how come she has that. Okay? And um, I really, that time it's, I feel down and I don't have any hope apart from just listen to whatever the doctor said. You know the word things like, I'm serving a living God. All the time, all I have, it just ask to direct me, especially the way I think. And uh, the, so for me to think that uh, whatever the doctor said, I can listen. Because sometimes, even in that moment, we have an argument with my husband because too much uh, injection to her. The father can't, you can't stand that. And as the mother too, I can't stand. But I keep convincing my husband for the sake of her. By the time that uh, Susie was there, she was smiling. She doesn't know that uh, what's going to happen. Right? She was happy. Like she thought that she's going to go and just have a checkup and came back. A nurse came and wiped her body. She was jumping and smiling. So we were walking together. She was laughing. And I was taking that video of her. She was smiling back at me. Then they put the needle on the hand and she was crying. By the time they just put the medicine inside, all of a sudden I can see how she went to sleep. That time I, I cry. Everything that happened in my life, I never cry or... But when the time she went to sleep, that's the time when I got into tears. I kissed her forehead and I put her on the bed. Then I come outside. During the period of the surgery, it's, uh, it's really, really scary. Eh? Like uh, the feeling I had, I'm, like, uh, I'm worried, I'm scared, you know, like, it's a blessing for me because of, um, uh, first of all, it's free and all it, it's the sickness that, um, you know, it's very hard for us to think about it. So I try to convince myself that I have to trust. We do the fasting and pray for her, you know. And um, after the surgery, when she awakes, you know, Awakes and the father called it. The first thing that she cried after she woke up, it's me. She came back and called me that uh, the operation is finished and she's awake and she's been crying. But after that, I feel so happy, feel so blessed, I feel relieved because uh, when the father said that uh, she stopped eating, I can't believe that. You know, like I was expecting that she can sleep the whole, another whole day or, sec you know, that's what I was expecting. You know, she start eating and then she start drinking. She received a very, very excellent uh, surgery and a service. There's no such service as it is, especially it's a life. You know? We trust a life to, to give it to you people's hands and we thank a lot for that opportunity that we received. For the experience I've been there, 
I think till what the mothers go through during uh, when they stay with a child. So for me, for all the nurses, for taking care of Suzy and the other children. It's a very, very powerful testimony for my husband to just to tell the families, <clears throat> the friends, what they receive when they there for that four days to five days there. It's really, really very excellent service and um, you know, the way the love and all, eh? it match what I always want to say, the codes that all surround the place, it match with the service. It's very good. For taking care of uh, Susie, for looking after her for the past uh, few days that uh, she's been there in Saiprem. All of the stuff there was really uh, very helpful to Suzy. You always have a lovely smile from the cleaning for all those uh, stuffs, not leading to all the doctors and nurses. There's no such word can explain how much we're blessed to have that. Yeah? There's no expenses at all, but it's just one day of surgery, it just solved everything. And until now, you can people can see she never eat like that. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the Lord for this opportunity for me and my daughter. Uh, without uh, the power of God, uh, she won't be sitting here like uh, the sickness that uh, she's been going through before. Until now, I'd like to thank them from the bottom of my heart and my family. I'm really honored uh, to, to be part of something special uh, for Sai Prema Hospital. Wonderful testimonials. Um, Thank you so much for sharing them. Maybe we can have all of our speakers turn on their videos. Dr. Wood, uh, I think, um, I hope you heard some of the presentations that we had at the beginning. Um, and uh, so we can have a short discussion now um, or longer. I think we have time. Um, so um, what I would like to um, to start with is, um, I, I have a question about um, Dr. Lugones. Uh, you talked about the situation in Latin America, and I'm curious. Uh, I actually got familiar with the with the system in Argentina um, this year, and I was very impressed with what has happened there with um, Plan Nacer and how congenital heart disease has been regionalized. Um, and so I'm curious. We started talking about lifelong care needs and the needs for adult congenital um, heart disease care. What what is the situation right now in Argentina, and do you know what um, what other countries are doing? Well, a very good question. In fact, good patients are are still not um, they are not really served as they should. Uh, one of the of the main focus that needs to be addressed is those those population because we have an increasing number of, of patients that are getting, being uh, are growing up and we do not have a plan a precise plan for that in fact what we do have are a couple of general hospitals that do have a first they do have the pediatric department and they do have the adult cardiac department the problem with pediatric centers like mine, the children's hospital, is that they allow us only to uh, receive patients up to 19 years old. I'm working in my hospital to, to be able to accept patients that are a bit, a bit older, but uh, it's not the general rule. It has to be, it's kind of exceptions. And of course, we cannot accept a 40-year-old patient. Uh, there are uh, main, there is mainly one center, public sector, that is taking all these cases, and uh, in uh, in the private sector, is it it is a bit different because there are some options, 
and surgeons are trained to treat these patients. The problem is that the public sector does not really have enough room for these patients. So, but in the private sector, for example, I was uh, formerly the, the head of, of cardiac surgery, pediatric cardiac or congenital heart cardiac surgery at the Favaloro Foundation, a very well-known hospital here, a private hospital. And there, more or less 15% of my patients were, were adults. So uh, we have the skills, we have the training, but now I moved to this, uh, some years ago, I moved to a pediatric uh, hospital. So I do not currently practice too many cases, but there are some centers that do perform it. It's a, it's a, we are in depth with, with, with that. Uh, we need to, to keep growing in, the, in that aspect. In, and I would um, welcome if you have a patient and family organizations that uh, work in Argentina to join Global Arch as well, because that's a really great community. Um, that, you know, as you saw, patient and families can be advocating for that. I was in Chile this um, this year for another conference, and they had exactly the same situation. They had great regionalized care for um, you know newborn to uh, pediatric to I think sixteen years old. Um, and all of those children were getting care, but past that age, um, there was a bottleneck of two hospitals that had waiting lists um, in private centers where most people couldn't afford to, to go. So um, seems like that's the next frontier. I don't know, Amy, if you have any comments on that um, based on your experience of trying to develop that in the United States with the Adult Congenital Heart Association. Well, I think the problem are very similar around the world. Um, this issue of pediatric hospitals wanting to discharge patients is still a very active issue in the US. Um, I think that also just to put out there that the, you know, the issue in adult congenital heart care, it varies in country. For many countries, the issue is not access to any kind of care. So there are countries where there's no cardiac services. But in many, many <clears throat> countries, including many middle income countries, there are cardiologists, there are adult cardiologists you can send some, somebody to. And so the issue actually is quality. It's actually, it's how do you access quality? And to just highlight that, um, at least in the US and in Europe, when a person trains to be a cardiologist who's going to treat adults in their two years of training, they have six hours of instruction on congenital heart disease. There's no obligation that they ever see a patient. There's no obligation that they really do anything. And so I think one of the messages I wanna really emphasize as we think about this together is, um, I think we all recognize that sending your complex congenital heart patients or even your congenital heart patients at all to those providers in many cases is going to be is severely lacking in quality. And as I said, the data from the high income country shows clearly that there will be very high rates of morbidity and mortality. So I, you know, I would say that that continues to be a problem. I think this is where the patient family organizations actually can make a real difference. Because I, I you know, I think we have many parent leaders that come to Global Arch, particularly those who work um, raising money or transporting kids out of country, who really do believe that the large majority of children that they help get care will not have the risk of lifelong care, lifelong issues and really are cured. Once they believe that, of course they want long-term care. Like I've never met a parent who didn't want their kid to get beyond age 18. So I think this is where um, I know that in Chile, they're working with the government, just pushing on that to get the just coverage over age um, 15, I know in Kerala also, this is an issue with the Fridium project that it only funds to age 18. And so I think this is where the patients and families being right there saying, I can't imagine your plan was to just get us to 18. How are we gonna keep doing this together? Thank you. Dr. Wood, those were very, um... Uh, interesting stories, very inspiring and wonderful to see um, those two young girls um, receiving the care they needed. Um, I actually am familiar with the Sri Sanjivani um, hospitals um, here in India. I, and I say in India because right now I'm visiting India. Um, but um, 
I'm curious, what are, what are the plans? I know that uh, the hospital is staffed, if I understand correctly, by visiting teams, the hospital in Fiji. How is lifelong care provided to, um, to those patients who receive um, surgery there? Yes, um, oh, thanks. It's great to be here with you guys. It's 4 a.m. here in New Zealand, so I thought I'd make the effort to try and do a live thing. I know um, probably uh, Dr. Lugione is, is go, probably going to go out for dinner in Argentina after this, as he does. Um, but it's interesting that in Fiji, because Sri Shavani, they've got their $25 million hospital, so they've got incredible infrastructure there. But yet they're reliant on visiting teams um, from New Zealand and Australia at the moment to provide expertise and staff, and particularly nursing staff, to provide the high quality care, um, which is required for post-operative. One of the things that they've done incredibly well, and I've only been there once when I when I was there in April, is that they've they've done the screening very, very well, in my opinion, compared to a lot of the other cardiac trips that I've been on. And that uh, they had um, uh, Sriganesh from India, who is an expert ultrasonographer, spending six months in the region, traveling around all the islands, just doing primary screening um, of anybody who was in a village, basically. And he was screening up to 180 children a day, just, just absolutely churning through a massive denominator of kids. And so we had excellent cases to operate on uh, who were healthy with lesions that were amenable to one operation, one, one overnight ICU stay, and basically curative intent, um, which is what they need to be starting doing. So um, I, I was very impressed with that aspect of the Fiji approach. What, what they don't have at the moment, um, and they're, they're quite open about this, with Kripali has a talk about this, is uh, long... Um, you know, immediate plans to start getting local surgeons, local anaesthetists, local um, ICU staff, all the other aspects of an intraoperative cardiac program that is is necessary. In terms of the local pediatrician inv involvement, it's fantastic as well. That's great. And Marianne spoke incredibly well, and she's an integral part of, of the process there. So their knowledge about what they need to look for is actually quite good unlike some of the other uh, other places I've visited where basically the most symptomatic kids get presented and you end up operating on people who have um, you know, prolonged ICU stays, worse outcomes, high morbidity and mortality. I mean, you know all this stuff. Um, so it, 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 I'm going to, to touch on some of that in the talk, um, but it really, they need to work out for themselves what sort of model they want for the region. It's not up to us to tell them what to do. We can provide them with some guidance and advice, but what they're doing is something that we don't do. You know, we don't have a many, many islands all around the place to have to cater for. Um, you know, we've got far more resources. So so I guess it needs to be driven by them on a, on a, a strategic level with advice rather than being told what to do. Um, and I don't envy their challenges there. Yes, and, and so um... Do I understand correctly that there is some follow-up um, physicians who can do their follow-up care and the parents are um, informed about that? Because I think you missed some of the, the conversations that we had at the at the beginning of the session. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. that. Absolutely. So Marianne follows them up. She can, um, you know, she's got access to follow-up echoes. They discuss with international teams. Um, Zoom has been great in that regard. Um, so apart from the geographical challenges of trying to get some of the kids from islands hundreds of thousands of kilometers away um there is there is follow-up with local providers and it was excellent to see when i went there that they were getting the local pediatricians and the local pediatricians who had cardiology interests over to the surgical program for the week so they could follow their patients through and be the lead carer for that patient and then take that patient back to the islands and for, and um and be involved in management, because that's essential. It's essential yeah. for the growth of the program. It's essential for the ongoing care of these kids as they reach adulthood, um, and to really make the whole thing uh, connect and work. Uh, so they did that very well, yes. 
And my apologies, I did not realize you also had slides um, uh, because we didn't see your, um, you at the beginning. Maybe we should give you the opportunity to um, show your presentation um, and we can continue with our conversation. Sure. Yeah. If I can work out how to uh, share my screen. So thank you very much for the invite to, to present. Um, let me know how this goes. It should be a PowerPoint presentation appearing now. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. So um, I've been on about uh, I've been on ten uh, aid trips uh, with New Zealand and Australian uh, missions as a, an anaesthetist joining the trips. Uh, so I don't have as much experience as some people, but I have seen about four different four different countries that we've visited and different approaches. Um, so these are my thoughts on uh, what we're doing to support um, pediatric heart surgery in the Pacific. Uh, so kia ora, which is what we say in New Zealand for hello and welcome, and bula bula, as they say in Fiji. It's great to be here talking to you. I'm just going to drag my screen across so it's not in the way. Just got the Zoom window in the way. Here we go. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about geography of the Pacific and populations in various regions and then talk about impacts of visits to the Pacific, the challenges in the Pacific, and then uh, future directions. And then maybe we can have a, some questions and a discussion after that. I've had a great time visiting um, some countries over the last 10 or 12 years as an ethicist, made some really great friends and colleagues, had some good experiences. Um, and even taking my kids to uh, some countries to help out with the play therapy, child life therapy aspects of um, pre prepping the kids before operations and then afterwards um, engaging them in physios and bubbles and rehab. So my children have had a great time uh, being involved and I feel very privileged to have been um, invited to be part of teams. Um, moving on to the Pacific, it's, it's an absolutely huge region. Um, it's broadly divided into three areas, Polynesia, Micronesia, and Melanesia. And uh, if you look at where cardiac centers are around the world, there are basically no cardiac centers in this whole region outside of Hawaii, New Zealand, and Australia. And now starting to get one in Papua New Guinea and Fiji, as we've heard, but 30 years ago, there was absolutely nothing in this region. The only other region in the world with this huge uh, need is sub-Saharan Africa. But you can see the, the, vast, the vast area that this covers. And the other thing is that the, the population in this region is, is quite uh, uh, often quite disparate in terms of where the people are. So in Papua New Guinea, there's nine or 10 million people. In Fiji, there's one million, one million people. And almost that in the Solomon Islands. But a lot of the other islands are relatively sparsely populated and reflected in the amount of congenital heart disease cases born each year. But PNG has over 2,000 effectively each year. So in the whole region, you're looking at about 3,000 uh, cases a year. So normally draining an area like that, and I guess in the States or the US, there'd be one or two cardiac centers, perhaps at most. So it is going to be essential for them um, to be able to move uh, families and children to a major centre, most likely in, in these two countries. And that seems to be where the process is going, Fiji and Papua New Guinea. So I was uh, lucky enough to do some trips with Open Heart International, did uh, nine trips with them. They're based in Sydney in Australia. They've been doing trips since 1993 uh, and have had uh, 75 trips to Pacific Islands since then. And about 2,000 patients have been treated in Papua New Guinea. Uh, was one of, it was the first place they went there, one, first place they went in uh, 1993. Here's the total patient numbers from Open Heart. As you can see, they go to other countries like Cambodia, Nepal, Rwanda, um, and Tanzania, uh, but really I want to focus on this top uh, top left part here, which is here, the trips to the Pacific Islands. 
Now, some of these case numbers have been uh, uh, some adult patients, mainly with rheumatic heart disease, but the vast majority of these cases have been children, particularly in Papua New Guinea. So you can see that the trips are averaging about uh, one a year to each place, uh, up to two a year Papua New Guinea sometimes, and about 30 children treated per each uh, visit. Uh, they've had an, around about 98, 30 day survival, um, I'm told by Open Heart International. Uh, but if you look at what they're actually doing in terms of numbers, considering there's 2,000 children a year born with congenital heart disease and only 20 to 40, maybe 50 are treated surgically each year, we're only realistically treating 1% to 2% of congenital heart disease in the region surgically. Um, now, uh, not all of the 2,000 will need a surgical operation, but th the point is that, that there is a massive need and there's a massive unmet need um, in the Pacific. But there has been some significant progress. Uh, over time, a local cardiac surgeon and cardiac anaesthetist have been trained, um, and that process took about five or 10 years. That's Noah, who's the surgeon, and he was uh, given training um, out to Geelong in Australia and also in Singapore. And Arvin Karu, who I was lucky to work with both of these, these men, um, who uh, came out to Westmead Children's in Sydney, and then also spent some time in India uh, training as a cardiac anaesthetist. And the Papua New Guinea um, hospital uh, approached Open Heart to create a qualification in cardiac an anaesthesia uh, so that it could examine Arvin and give him a local qualification from uh, the Papua New Guinea University uh, so that he would meet a certain standard and they would be um, they would recognize that locally. And they've been doing um, some closed cases independently for eight or 10 years ago, 10 years now, which they weren't doing before. So it's been slow but steady process there. Um, and there's been some indirect benefits to Papua New Guinea. There's been development of a, a more comprehensive blood bank. Previously, they only had whole blood. Now they've got fractionated blood with platelets and FFP cryo available. So their trauma uh, capabilities have improved. The ICU capabilities vastly improved in uh, Port Moresby. Previously, I think they mainly treated the conditions like snake bite, tetanus, and uh, Guillain Barre uh, requiring ventilation. But uh, now they've got significantly more capability to treat uh, sepsis and other uh, conditions uh, in their intensive care unit. They've also developed a coronary care unit on site and which has been funded by a petroleum company. Um, the petroleum companies have to uh, give a certain proportion of their profits to uh, local projects and they have decided to fund uh, the cardiac unit there in Port Moresby General Hospital, which is good because that's necessary for a trip. And then other hospital infrastructure, which didn't exist 30 years ago, such as piped oxygen and suction and secure power supplies to the hospital, uh, are a result of um, engagement and uh, you know advice to the hospital for doing cardiac surgery. So um, that's uh, sort of the OHI Papua New Guinean experience. It's a work in progress. Uh, in terms of uh, New Zealand outreach to the Pacific, Hearts for Kids started up in 2014 and has had six visits to Fiji since then, um, all to Suva. 91 kids have been uh, treated and there's increasing local engagement and the reports are available on their website. As we talked about and we were alluding to before in our discussion, there's some significant challenges in the Pacific. There's no cardiac centres outside Australia, New Zealand or Hawaii. There's many, many small populations which are geographically far apart with logistical transport difficulties. Um, and that is not just for going to surgery, it's also for assessment and screening. We've sort of come to the conclusion, talking to my colleagues who have been doing this for longer than me, that if you are going to develop a cardiac centre somewhere, you almost certainly require a local medical and nursing school to be present in the region. 
and Fee, uh, Suva and um, Port Moresby have that infrastructure. Um, it's difficult to see how in many other places in the Pacific would be able to support uh, a Macardia unit. The screening is an absolutely essential part of it. Um, and I think this uh, Sri uh, Sajivani model has been very successful in that regard. You need ongoing financial support. Uh, and that uh, is easier for, it seems easier for people to support infrastructure than it does for them to fund um, ongoing transport and particularly transport of patients and screening missions. So that is another, another challenge. Um, and equipment, uh, obviously uh, uh, pediatric heart surgery requires complex um, equipment and technology, and there's a major lack of local distributors in the Pacific. Even Australia and New Zealand, we are relatively very small on the, on the global stage. So it's not easy to get um, you know, pediatric oxygenators or other parts for um, trips if they are not in the, um, in the Pacific region uh, at that particular time and support for the technology which is going to be used in these areas. So I guess there's three things that need to be continued to be thought about in order to make these things happen. There's capital expenditure of the hospitals and uh, are we actually going to do things? There's recurrent funding to, to actually drive the process. And then there's resources, both um, the personnel and uh, political resources to make it happen. And that's the, um, the hospital I visited in April, the um, San, San Giovanni Hospital in Fiji, which is a 25 million Fiji dollar facility. So it was a pleasure to work there. It is uh, geographically not co-located with the main hospital, uh, but they have links there. And... Um, the, the one thing that I guess that they're hoping to do is train more local staff to be able to take over some of the perioperative roles over the next uh, few years. Teamwork is essential in all these all these things, as, as we know. And uh, we had a great time um, getting on with these kids and, and an international team came together that I was very lucky to be part of. So future directions. Uh, Look, I think we, we need to have both national, regional, international strategic approaches to decide on main centres for cardiac care in the Pacific. It absolutely requires local engagement um, and expertise with international expertise. Uh, and it's great to see that happening in uh, some of these countries. And as you can see with some of the outcomes, if you get a screening right and choose um, good operations with good staff. The challenges are uh, numerous, but excellence is still possible in low resource settings. And to give you an idea about the Fiji experience, it costs about you five thousand US dollars to do an open heart operation in Fiji with the the current system, versus a hundred thousand US dollars to fly them out to Auckland and New Zealand and have open heart surgery uh, internationally. So they figure they can do about 20 operations uh, for the price of one um, outsourced operation, but that does rely on uh, donated time and expertise with cardiac surgeons and ethodist nurses coming in. But uh, I think it's quite exciting to see what they're doing already. And here's some um, here's a picture of the team that I was with with Dr. Siddy. Um, and Dr. Ranga and, and Dr. Marianne, who's a local pediatrician, and Krupali, who's the uh, director of the hospital there, uh, in um, April this year, uh, and it, we had a we had a really good time, and I'm really pleased with the the direction things are going there. It's also great to see that they have a commitment to education because they held a conference there. Um, where I met Prof um, Kalangos and uh, it, was, it was great to have that at the end of a, a week and a half of work. I'm just going to stop there. Thanks. Thank you again. Um, it was great to see your um, um, 
more information about your work. Um, I um, I wanted to ask, um, I don't know, Amy and Grace, if you're still on the line. Um, first of all, I wanted to say, uh, uh, Dr. Wood, that it's, uh, this is a real problem in small island nations um, in general, providing healthcare and talking about complex healthcare like that for congenital heart disease or rheumatic heart disease, if I'm correct, uh, Fiji does have still a fairly big burden, large burden of that, um, it presents a challenge. It's a real challenge. Um, and so I was curious um, if uh, Amy or Grace have any comments on that, because uh, Global Arch um, does have members who focus both on uh, rheumatic heart disease and on congenital heart disease. And uh, we spent many hours talking about that. And um, if you uh, have any comments about that, Amy. So the comments specifically about uh, seeing the two populations as sort of a combined population, is that what you're asking for comment that about? And, and in a situation where we have such wide distances with small populations, if, we've, um, if that's been discussed at all. No, absolutely. I mean, it's funny because I'll note that um, Global Arch had about 60 group leaders from 30 groups in Washington, D.C. at the World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology. It was very interesting to see that even in high-income countries, this issue of being on a faraway island can be a real issue. So, for example, the group from Iceland was there, and they actually help with transport costs from Iceland, even though that's a high-income country. And it has big, they were talking a lot about this issue of follow-up because, you know, they're on an island. So even in a situation where you have a superb healthcare system, um, there's these challenges. So I can't imagine what it's like in Fiji. And I really laud your efforts. Looking at the RHD and CHD issue, I mean, one of the things that people find surprising about Global Arch is that we do focus both on congenital rheumatic heart disease and traditionally, of course, particularly in pediatric cardiology and cardiology in general, those have been seen as really different things, right? Um, a large focus in RHD is obviously eradication and then CHD, whole different thing. It's not eradicable. But our experience, again, when we started the organization, we actually, it was supposed to be the Congenital Heart Leadership Summit. We really didn't know about RHD, like many people in high income countries. When we brought the patient family leaders together, what we discovered very concretely is that although RHD and CHD are very different in terms of how they start, once you pivot to what your experience is, once you have it, it's virtually identical. There are small differences. Um, and obviously the specifics of the heart surgery you get might be different, but for example, for a family going through surgery, who has, it doesn't really matter how your child's heart got damaged for somebody with an artificial heart valve like I have. You know, it doesn't really matter why you have it. And if you look at the ongoing care needs, and Bistro and I actually did a little bit of informal work on this, um, there isn't a difference. If you, The general care needs are going to be the same, right? Everybody needs a surgeon, they need access to echo treatment for heart failure medications, anticoagulation, um, antibiotic prophylaxis. The one thing that's going to be different is that ongoing prophylaxis, which is different for HD patients. But otherwise, you know, the logical way to think about this, and I, I would really encourage more thinking this way, is this isn't actually about CHD. It's really about childhood onset heart disease that there will be some places that maybe have a specialized center, but for most places with most of these diseases, they're going to be seen in the same place. And that's, you know, and, and this is where we can really collaborate and advocate to make sure that those services are there in country for those patients. Um, Beaster, does that answer your question? I hope I didn't just answer yeah. a completely different question. No, no, it does answer your question. And I and the childhood onset heart disease is a term that's been used by um, Australia. I'm not so sure about uh, New Zealand. Um, is it the same terminology or um, are we talking about pediatric and congenital heart disease? Dr. Wood. I haven't actually heard that term before, child onset heart disease, but I like okay. it. I'll remember that one. Um, I, I have a question also for um, for Grace and and Grace. I know that um, 
Malaysia. So Malaysia is considered a country, same similar region that we just um, saw, uh, but a, a country that um, actually has developed some uh, pediatric cardiac services um, congenital and is developing adult congenital services fairly successfully, um, still not fully um, full coverage for the whole country. And I know some of the states are um, uh, that are farther away from Kuala Lumpur um, don't have centers. Uh, what, what's happening there? How are patients getting care? What do they do? Um, so we do have um, government, fund, government hospitals in like states that are far from the city. Um, but a lot of times they will just need to travel. So then they will need funding, um, especially because Malaysia has kind of two sides that's over the seas. Um, so the, um, from those from the other peninsula part of the other part of Malaysia will then need to get on a flight. Um, it's about two hours to come to the city um, to get care. So um, a lot of the hospitals that do um, these surgeries are mostly in the city. So there's a lot of involvement of not just transportation, but, you know, help um, in, in different areas to actually get them to come um, and receive care. And a lot of times it's um, really just um, ignorance. Um, and that's why we do a lot of educational webinar because, um, and also because of language, um, because sometimes they just don't know what to look out for in their kids. They think they just do the surgery once, the kid is fine lead a normal life, you know, like can do everything. They don't, you know, really looking after themselves. So yeah, it's just a bit of a challenge, especially uh, for those not in the city. In, in the city, you mean uh, those that are probably not close to Kuala Lumpur, Penang from Borneo Island, right? Yes, Borneo Island, um, close to KL, Penang, those cities. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if we can take questions from the audience. Um, the organizers have not uh, uh, let me know if there are any questions that are coming from the audience. Probably not, since I'm not hearing anything. Um, do we, uh, do you have questions for each other? I'm curious that like, this is um, a, a when we were initially proposing this to Dr. Kalangos um, to speak about lifelong care, um, obviously there is a huge role that I think NGOs can play, but um, as we're hearing from Grace, there is still a major need for the government to step in, as we're seeing from Latin America, that a lot of government programs are being developed. Um, but I'm curious if you have questions for each other um, based on, you know, experience, Amy, that we've seen, uh, or Grace, you probably hear from some patients from Indonesia, which is a very similar situation with a lot of um, many islands population spread out. Um, um, or Dr. Lugones, you spoke about some of the um, some of the countries in South America that don't have any services developed. Um, so, yeah, well, I wanted to just to make a comment. I was really uh, I, I was really glad to hear about the the organizations that come from families and patients. And I must say that here in Argentina, they have uh, really empowered themselves. Uh, in this aspect and in fact well I had created one of them and it is thanks to those organizations that for example the the law for comprehensive care has finally been approved uh, that is that is really very good because that law we worked a lot on this law because we wanted to have uh, the patient and the family covered in all senses. That is, in from the social aspect, from the medical aspect, uh, protecting the, the kids' rights, and and it has taken a lot of time because it depended on the on the different chambers of the government to be approved. So it failed and it was rejected, and then came back and and it was thanks to the persistence of the patients and the families and of course the, the healthcare team but mainly because of of the of the of the enormous strength that the that, that the families and the, and the and the patients showed during this process so i i i wanted to outline that and i want to thank you uh, to thank the organizations that take care about these things because they do a lot 
That's wonderful to hear. And we would love to hear their story in detail, how they got a law passed or helped pass a law. Well, yes, and I, I should note that we do not have your, those organizations are not members of Global Arch. So no, please exactly. tell them about us and we can feature them. We want to hear I about will, their successes. I will put you in contact. In, fa <laughs> in fact, I, I founded a, 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 an association that is called Cardio Congenit Congenitas. Then, uh, that could be Cardio Congenital. Uh, so um, now it is, it is, uh, it is, uh, it, what, there, there are a couple of mothers. Usually mothers are, are the strongest part of the equation. Uh, and I congratulate you for that. And, and they are, they, they are really taking this to the next level. So I will try to put them in, in contact with you. It would be fantastic if they could take part of, of Global Arch. That would be fantastic. That would be great. Although I have to note that mothers are great, but when it's the patient themselves, particularly if they've almost been killed and they really don't want it to happen to anybody else, <laughs> they can yes. be equally, if not more passionate, at least in of my personal course. experience. In fact, one of the founders, was a patient of mine uh, and now she's 40 and I operated on her when she was 30 for a VSD and, and pulmonary stenosis when she was a grown-up patient and she's she's now very very compromised with the with the with this so it, it is very true this, this is very true yeah and we would like welcome any patient groups um from um, uh, the Micronesia and from the region that you serve, um, Dr. Wood, is, I think that it will be very important, even if it's just a support group and not necessarily a group that is trying to make policy changes like what we're talking about right now. Um, I think it would be wonderful to, the point of Global Arch is to uh, bring patients and families to learn from each other and, um, and to help each other improve um, at the same rate. Bistra, I think our time is up, is that correct? I think we're close to our time, yes. Okay, I have one last question, sure, which is go a ahead. little bit of a challenging question for the two of you. And I, this is my eternal question. So I, you know, I understand that why, when we started doing these surgeries, we believed that most of them would be curative. I do understand that because of the lack of the data. And I also understand that this is a paradigm shift. I think congenital heart disease started surgically and there's a real belief people are very invested in the idea that we can create a population where people will have a normal life. But we also know this isn't true, okay? And I know Dr. Wood, you weren't here, but I can show you abundant data that shows that things that we previously thought were one and done, so really frightening rates of mortality and morbidity, even in things like repaired ASD, particularly when you get to things like pregnancy. So here's my question. Why do people persist in saying that? Why are we not seeing the shift we need? Because I understand that there's a real challenge just in the resources. So anybody who wants to say, I know, I know this patient needs ongoing surveillance, but I don't know how to do it. I don't know where it is. I don't have it. That is understandable to me. But what is not understandable is the continuing voice that says, we just do one and done surgeries. These kids are going to be fine. We don't need to worry about that issue. And that's not an insignificant voice right now. So I'd love your comments on that because it's certainly frustrating. If I may, yes, I agree with you. And in fact, I thought the same while, while you were mentioning it. Uh, in fact, also, there has been a publication, recent research from the Danish, uh, Danish colleagues, which said that even, for example, even small ASDs, very small ASDs that in the past were not supposed to be needed to close, they in fact show a, 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 a drastic a reduction in life expectancy and a lot of, well, you are aware of that. So, so it was a slide I took out, actually. Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I know that I know those people. I work with them in some projects. Uh, so BBK Jordan is, is a friend of mine and, and they have done a real work and they have opened our eyes to this fact. Uh, I think that one of the main reasons, uh, there, there are a couple of reasons. From the surgeon's perspective, the thing is that we tend to, to uh, think that these procedures, let's say ASD closure or BSC closure, uh, 
are easy procedures and we see the patient as, as the patient is evolving rapidly and in a good way. So the patient is doing fine, symptoms from congenital, congenital heart uh, failure disappear and the patient starts getting, gaining weight and all that. So our follow-up usually is very short and we are the ones that say to the mother that the operation will have risk and, and we tend to focus only on the operation and the, and the short-term follow-up. So I think there is a bias and we must acknowledge that those patients will need long, lifelong follow-up and we are slowly, slowly trying to set up our minds to, to that. We, with many other surgeries, we, uh, we are already aware that they are not curative. I, what I always say to, to our patients is that we never cure a patient. We never cure a patient, not even an ASD, because the patient will have increased risk of arrhythmia and all that. And I always say to my the parents and the, and the patients that the, the one that is born with a congenital heart defect will be will have to be uh, taken care of for the rest of the of, of, of their life. So, uh, but I think that that's something that needs to change in the whole health healthcare team, uh, and it's slowly slowly starting to change. But we need more. We need more. We need more kind of like these talks and this presentation and this kind of research that opens our eyes to 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 this fact. Thank you for that comment. I don't know, Dr. Wood, if you want to comment on that as well. Oh, fantastic comment. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, I could. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And certainly, if you're looking at quality of of life, there are non-surgical ways of helping people um, as well as surgical ways. And um, I think we in, in medicine, it's very easy to get involved in just surgical stuff and then forget about all the other sort of wraparound care that would actually improve someone's life. My other job is pain medicine. And we often see people in a lot longer trajectory than we do in anesthesia. So, and I've did a reasonable amount of palliative care looking at quality of life and life goals and stuff through my training. And I think that we're really quite poor at that. Certainly medical school was quite poor at that when I went through it 20 years ago. Uh, but we're slowly getting better. And um, and uh, it's it's through this kind of stuff where, where if the follow-up's essential. I guess the, the challenge that I've seen on some of these trips, and I just want to, I'm not wanting to oversimplify it, but you've got a choice of 20 or 30 kids to do you know the story and the, whether you do the ones with rheumatic heart disease who who won't be monitored on warfarin versus the ones who are struggling with vsds age one and are going to get into real trouble in the next year or so you're always going to choose the ones with holes and it's simplistic to say that you fix them it's a nice story but as you say it's not that's not the whole story and i i think that this whole wraparound care is just essential. So I really, uh, I really like your comment and pointing out that that is not as simple as it, it would like to, you know, it'd be nice to imagine it is. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Those are very thoughtful comments. I really appreciate it. I know it's not a, it's not necessarily an easy topic. Um, and all we are trying to do is to promote a conversation about this. I think that that's what we're trying to do, to promote a conversation among all stakeholders that um, take part in this, uh, and we know there are many, um, starting with you know the patients and their families and the multidisciplinary team that sees them and the obstetricians that will see the women who get pregnant afterwards um, and uh, the pediatricians. So I think that it's, a, it's an important conversation and I really appreciate that Dr. Kalangos um, agreed for us to have it in this forum. Um, and I hope we can continue and um, keep talking about that and improve care for lifelong care for people in need of it with pediatric and congenital heart disease. Thank you again for your participation. I Thank think you with so that much. we're done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.